In this major overhaul of an aircraft engine, your job will be to clean the parts of the disassembled engine, inspect and repair them, and check all specified clearances against the table of limits. To review quickly the disassembly procedure, you'll recall that the engine was removed from the airplane and mounted on an engine stand. Then it was disassembled. The cylinders and pistons were removed. The oil sump was also removed from the crankcase. Then the gear case cover. And finally, the two halves of the crankcase were separated to get at the insides of the engine. This made it possible to lift out the crankshaft and connecting rods and the, the other internal part of the engine. With the engine torn down, your first job is to clean every last part thoroughly. Scrub all the smaller parts, like connecting rods, in a tub of cleaning solvent. Use a stiff brush to do a thorough job. When you finish cleaning the small parts, dunk the crankshaft in the... A brush will help you clean in around the throws, journals, and bearing surfaces. When you dry the shaft with the compressed air gun, use the air stream to blow out and clean the oil passages in the crankshaft. This is a must in engine overhaul. Clean both halves of the crankcase, inside and out. It's a good idea to dip the whole thing in a cleaning solvent. All the dirt, oil, and sludge that gather on the metal must be removed. When it's clean, dry the crankcase off carefully with compressed air. Be very sure the oil passages in the case are clear. Blow them out with air and cleaning solvent. Before cleaning the oil sump, make a careful search for metal particles that may have chipped off the engine. Wipe out the inside with a clean rag. Loose particles of metal might be a clue to serious trouble in an engine. If you should find any chips like this, determine the kind of metal and look for the cause. Clean every part you've disassembled with equal thoroughness. Cleaning of all the engine parts not only makes your inspection more efficient, but it allows you to check clearances with greater accuracy. When all your cleaning is finished and the parts shine land like new, you're ready to inspect the crankshaft. The crankshaft is the most vital part of any engine and it must be in perfect condition. First in order is a visual inspection of the shaft. Inspect the propeller nut threads. Look for cracks, scores, or other damage. Inspect the propeller key for burrs or signs of wear, and check it in the keyway to be sure it fits properly. This should be a very snug fit. Ordinary visual inspection of the crankshaft is not enough, however, as fractures can't always be seen. The use of some kind of particle inspection is a more certain test. In the magnetic particle inspection, the crankshaft is magnetized by sending a charge of electric current through it. The shaft is then thoroughly soaked with a solution containing magnetic particles.
If there's a fracture, the particles contained in the solution will adhere to the edges of the fracture and make it visible. This shaft is in sound shape, since there is no indication of cracks. So that you will recognize a fracture when you see it, here is a fractured shaft from another engine. Notice how the particles cling to the line of the crack and bring it into relief. A fractured shaft must be replaced. When the inspection is complete, the shaft must be demagnetized by moving it back and forth inside a coil chamber and then removing it slowly. But you must be certain too that the shaft is not out of alignment. A stand like this is most efficient for this test. A dial indicator put on the shaft will check it for run out or straight straightness when the shaft is rotated. Make this check with the indicator on the end of the shaft. Make another check with the indicator on the center main bearing surface. The needle on the dial shouldn't vary more than is allowed by your table of limits. You can check in your engine manual for the maximum runout allowance. On this engine, it's five thousandths of an inch. Now you need to measure the seven bearing surfaces of the shaft in order to determine clearances. On this shaft, there are three main bearing surfaces where the shaft rotates on the bearings in the case. There are also four bearing surfaces where the connecting rods are attached to the shaft. Use a micrometer of the right size to measure the diameter of the shaft. The purpose of these measurements and checking of clearances is to discover wear that wouldn't be visible to the eye. Take a measurement in two directions to check for out of round. If there's a slight difference in the reading in different positions on the shaft, Record the smaller diameter on your check sheet. The next bearing surface is for a connecting rod. Measure this diameter in the same way and record the smaller measurement. Later, you will measure the connecting rod bearing and, by subtraction, get the clearance. Now, measure each of the other five bearing surfaces and rec record the diameters. When that's done, you're finished with the crankshaft for the time being and can go ahead with an inspection of the connecting rods. Take the rod apart and slip the bearing out. Check the bearing seat for cracks, nicks, or scores.
examine the split bearings for scores, chipping, or flaking. Give the rod itself a careful checking over. Here's a bearing that's scored. This score is deep enough so the bearing will have to be replaced. These split bearings are always replaced in pairs, not individually. The bearings fit easily into the seat and they'll only go in one way. You can't go wrong. So far, this rod is in good condition. Bolt, bolt it back together so you can give it a check for possible bend or twist. To make this check, insert a special mandrel through each of the holes in the rod, using shafts that fit snugly. To make the check accurately, tighten the nuts with a wrench. Now prepare a set of parallel bars with four metal gauge blocks on the surface plate. Then rest the ends of the mandrels on, on the blocks like this. Now compare the distance between the ends of the mandrels on each side of the rod. Use a dial indicator for accuracy. The dial indicator reading should be exactly the same on each side of the rod if the connecting rod is perfectly straight. Now make a check for twist. If the ends of the mandrels rest firmly on the gauge blocks, and there's no wobble at the corners. The rod is not twisted. With all the connecting rods inspected and with damaged part replaced, next measure the bearings at each end to obtain clearances. Before doing that, however, let's be sure of the clearances we're after. You've already measured the diameter of the crankshaft at the four throws where the connecting rods fit. Now you want to measure the diameter of the bearing in the large end of the connecting rod. Then by subtraction, you can find out what the clearance is between the crankshaft and the connecting rod bearing. In operation, the crankshaft is nearly centered in the rod like this with clearance for oil all the way around. Of course, when you check the clearance, your figure will represent the total, as if the rod were pushed to one side. Now make the measurements. Use a telescoping gauge and micrometer to measure the diameter of the bearing through which the crankshaft fits. Take your measurement in more than one direction, and if there's a slight variation, use the larger diameter. 
Now, to figure the clearance between the crankshaft and some connecting rod bearing, subtract to get the difference. Check this clearance with that given in the table of limits in your manual. Your clearance is satisfactory. The bearing in the small end of the connecting rod where the piston pin fits also needs to be measured. Measure this diameter in more than one direction, and if there's a difference, use the larger diameter. Record this measurement, and you can obtain the clearance between the piston pin and the bearing. You'll remember that you measured the diameter of the piston pin when you overhauled the pistons. Now you can get the clearance between the piston pin and the bearing in the small end of the connecting rod by subtracting one diameter from the other. Now look up the allowable clearance and the table of limits in your engine manual. Your clearance is okay. Give each of the four connecting rods an equally thorough examination and measure the bearing diameters in the same way. You've now completed your inspection of the crankshaft and connecting rods. The camshaft, the two halves of the crankcase, and the other disassembled parts remain to be overhauled before the engine can be reassembled in the overhaul of the engine. The crankshaft and connecting rods have been cleaned and inspected, and the various clearances between parts have been checked. The next part to be inspected is the camshaft. Examine the camshaft gear carefully for cracks. Pay particular attention to the teeth to be sure none of them show signs of excessive wear. Inspect the camshaft for cracks or nicks. Check the bearing surfaces and cam lobes for wear, scoring, or pitting. This camshaft appears to be in good condition, so you can go ahead with your measurements to obtain clearances. There are three bearing surfaces on the camshaft where it fits into the crankcase. The diameter of the shaft at each of these three points must be measured, and later you will measure the bearings in the crankcase to get the clearances. Use the micrometer on these bearing surfaces the same as you did on the crankshaft. Measure in at least two directions, and if there's variation, Use a smaller diameter. Record the diameter on your check sheet for future reference. Check the center bearing surface in the same way, taking two readings at right angles to each other. Record the smaller reading, 
and then check the diameter of the bearing surface at the front end of the camshaft. This completes your work on the camshaft, and the next step is to inspect the hydraulic cam lifts. Remove the tag temporarily so it won't get in your way. And look the tappet over carefully to be sure it's in good condition. Now measure the outside diameter of the tappet. Later, you'll measure the guide in the crankcase into which the tappet fits, so you can figure the clearance. The purpose of all measuring of clearances is to discover wear on parts that wouldn't be visible to the naked eye. Record this diameter on your check sheet for the time being. In the same way, inspect and measure each one of the eight hydraulic tappets. Next, check the oil pump parts. Examine the driven gear carefully, looking especially for wear on the gear teeth. Then inspect the drive gear and shaft. Place the gears on the cover so you can check the clearance between the teeth and the cover. To make this check, use a feeler gauge as a go-no-go -no -go gauge. Use a feeler one size over the specified maximum clearance. It should not be able to enter between the edge of the tooth and the cover. Then select a feeler one size under the specified minimum clearance. You should be able to insert this one easily. Make this check for every tooth on each of the two gears. These clearances are a check on the efficiency of the pump. Now remove the drive gear and measure the diameter of its shaft with a micrometer. Then with a telescoping gauge, check the clearance of the shaft with the hole in the gear case cover. Now put the plate back on and tighten the nuts so you can check for excessive play of the gears or for binding. If it's satisfactory, you can remove the cover again and continue your inspection. Inspect the tachometer drive housing and check its fit on the shaft of the drive gear. Inspect the parts of the oil pressure relief valve to see that they are in good condition. And finally, give the gear case cover itself a thorough visual inspection.
two halves of the crankcase are next in order. Inspect each case closely for if it fatigue cracks or other evidences of weakness. Note the studs particularly to be sure they're tight and straight and that their threads are in good condition. If the threads look as though they might be stretched, check them by running a nut down on the stud. The nut should run down freely and shouldn't bind if the threads are okay. Sometimes cracks develop at the bolt holes, so be sure to make a thorough inspection of each hole. Make certain that the parting surfaces are smooth, so the sections will fit together tightly. If you find any nicks, stone them down. The parting surfaces should make a tight seal. Lift out each bearing half from its seat so you can inspect both the bearing and its seat thoroughly. The seat into which the bearing fits sometimes gets cracked or worn. And the bearing itself is subject to scoring and scratching. However, these appear to be okay. There are three main bearings for the crankshaft and three more for the camshaft. E each of these should be given a careful examination. The other half of the crankcase should be inspected in the same way. You'll remember that you measured the crankshaft bearing surfaces where they fit into the crankcase. Now you want to measure the, the crank bearings and get clearances. In order to measure the diameter of the bearings, you'll have to put the two halves of the crankcase back together temporarily. To get accurate measurements of the bearing diameters, bolt the sections together by tightening the nuts on all bearing studs. Now measure the di diameter of the bearings. Take your measurements in at least two directions and use the larger one if there's a variation. Now you can figure the clearance between the crankshaft and the crankcase bearings at this point. Subtracting, you get three thousandths of an inch. You'll find the allowable clearance shown in the table of limits in your manual. Your clearance of three thousandths is satisfactory then. Next, take the diameter of the rear main bearing, the one at the other end of the crankcase. Use the telescoping gauge and micrometer in exactly the same way and figure your clearance by looking up on the check sheet the diameter of the crankshaft at this point. to reach down through a cylinder port to get at the center main bearing to measure it. Otherwise, the procedure is exactly the same. <laughs> 
you'll have to take readings of the three camshaft bearings in the crankcase. This is the rear one. Again, if there's a variation, take the larger reading. With this reading, you can figure the clearance with the camshaft by subtracting. result should be checked against the table of limits. The center and front bearing measurements for the camshaft will have to be taken by reaching through the cylinder port. They must be taken, however, and the clearance is checked for each one. After removing the nuts, Take the two halves of the crankcase apart again so you can measure the hydraulic tappet guides. With a telescoping gauge, check the inside diameter of each guide. Take your measurements at at least two points in the guide, and if there's a variation, use the larger diameter. Now you can figure the clearance of the tappet in the guide. Check your result against the table of limits. Measure each of the hydraulic tappet guides in the same way, and make certain that all the clearances are within the allowable limits. We've now completed all the checking of clearances for this section, and there's left only an inspection of the remaining miscellaneous parts. Remove all the connections from the intake pipes and take the clamps off the connections. Then inspect each of the intake pipes carefully for cracks and dents. New rubber connections are always installed at the time of an overhaul. As you put the old clamps back on the new rubber, inspect each clamp. If any of them are broken or don't work properly, new ones should replace them. When all the intake pipes and their connections have been put into condition, inspect the pushrod housing flanges. Check the parting surfaces particularly to be sure they're smooth. Next, go over each of the eight pushrod connections. Install a new set of rubbers in the clamps and discard the old, the old ones. See that the threads of the tightening screws are in good condition. 
With this inspection, you've finished your overhaul of the engine, and you're ready to reassemble the parts and reinstall the engine. All of these engine parts have been thoroughly inspected. Necessary repairs and replacements have been made, and all clearances have been checked. You're ready to reassemble the engine and replace it in the airplane. The first step is to assemble the connecting rods to the crankshaft. Check the tag to see where the rod goes, and remove the tag. Now separate the two parts of the rod and oil the bearing surfaces thoroughly, both on the crankshaft and the rod itself. Install the rod on the crankshaft throw, oil the cap, and bolt the two parts together. Install the rod so that the number will face upward when the rod is in its cylinder port. have been installed, tighten the nuts carefully with a torque wrench to the value specified in the table of limits. The castle nuts used here must be safetyed with cutter pins. Tap the pin in with a soft face mallet and then bend the two ends back neatly. nuts are safetyed, use a flurry gauge to check the end clearance of each rod on its throw. You'll find a specified end clearance given in the table of limits. Now to reassemble the gear case cover. Put a new gasket on the oil screen and dip the screen in clean engine oil. Then screw it in, wipe off excessive oil, and tighten it securely. Install a plastic plug in the thermometer hole temporarily to keep dirt out. A new oil seal should be installed in the tachometer drive housing. This is a very snug fit. Tap the new seal into place with a soft face mallet. Then install a new gasket on the tachometer drive housing. The tachometer drive housing and oil pump gears are installed together. Oil the two gears and install them. Then install the oil pump cover plate over the studs and the gear shaft and safety it. To prevent the tachometer drive oil seal from being pushed out of place when you install it, insert a rod through the seal.
match the end of the rod to the shaft and guide the tachometer drive housing down over the shaft. Then screw the tachometer drive housing in and tighten it. Don't over tighten it. Notice that it has a left hand thread so the rotation of the shaft won't loosen it. Next, install the oil pressure relief valve. Use a new gasket on the cap. Then install the valve, the spring, and the cap, and tighten the assembly securely. This completes the assembly of the gear case cover, but there's one more check to make. Test the oil, oil pump gears to be sure they run freely. They shouldn't bind. Now you're ready to mount the 2-4 crankcase on the engine stand. Before inserting the hydraulic tappets in their guides, remove the plunger and dip the tappet in clean oil. Then insert it in its guide. Do the same with the other three. Then install the tappet in the other crank kit case. They'll remain in place in the 2-4 crank case, but in the 1-3 crank case, you'll have to prevent them from dropping out when you turn the case over to install it. You can do this by temporarily slipping a push rod hose connection over the end of the tappet on the outside of the case. Now make sure each of the bearings gets a thorough oiling. Use oil very liberally as you reassemble the engine. Oil each of the bearing surfaces of the camshaft and lay the camshaft and its bearings in the crankcase. Now oil the bearing surfaces of the crankshaft and lay the crankshaft and its bearings in the crankcase. Be careful to guide the two and four connecting rods through the cylinder ports so they won't damage the sides of the ports.
Check the front end clearance of the crankshaft with a feeler gauge. You'll find specifications for this end clearance in your table of limits. Make a similar end clearance check on the camshaft. Dip the oil seal in oil and push it securely into place on the front of the crankshaft. Apply a very thin film of sealing compound to the outside edges of the cutting surfaces of both halves of the crankcase. Now you can install the 1-3 crankcase on the 2-4 case. Guide the 1 and 3 connecting rods carefully through the cylinder ports and be sure you get the dowel bolts to their proper locations. With the two sections fitted together, you can reinstall the bolts that hold them. Before you put all the bolts in, however, check the crankshaft and the camshaft to be sure they move freely. Then you can finish bolting the crankcase together. All the nuts should tighten evenly to the torque value given in the table of limits. This will prevent undue stresses on the crankcase. These nuts are safetyed with pal nuts. The correct, correct way to install a pal nut is to run it down finger tight with the open end up and then give it a quarter turn with a wrench. Now reinstall the camshaft gear in position for correct valve timing. A valve timing mark is stamped on the side of one of the cam gear teeth. To synchronize the two shafts, that mark should mesh between the two timing marks stamped on the crankshaft gear. To position the camshaft, reach through a cylinder port and rotate it until the bolt holes line up. They'll only match in one way. Then install the bolts that secure the gear to the camshaft. Tighten the bolts evenly to the torque value specified in your table of limits and safety them. To check the backlash of the camshaft and crankshaft gears, set up a dial indicator with its arm flush against the tooth of the camshaft gear. Now, holding the crankshaft gear with your left hand, move the camshaft gear back and forth. The amount of play shown on the dial should be checked against your table of limits. If you have too much play, you will have to replace the gear. This one is okay. Now you're ready to install the gear case cover, and the first step is to install a new gasket over the studs. This gasket has to go on flush against the crankcase so the holes fit properly over the studs 
and line up with the main oil passages in the crankcase. Before you install the cover, give both gears a generous application of oil. Then put some oil into the oil pump to lubricate those gears. And fit the gear case cover on the studs and assemble the washers and nuts. Tighten the nuts evenly to the torque value given in the table of limits and safety them with power nuts. At this point, you can safety the oil screen to a gear case cover. However, do not safety the oil pressure relief valve cap at this time, as the final adjustment will be made when you run in the engine. Now turn the engine upside down so you can get at the oil sump opening. With a sharp knife, cut off the portion of the gear case cover gasket that crosses the opening. Be sure not to let any of the gasket material drop into the case. Then install the oil suction tube with a new gasket in the tapped hole in the bottom of the gear case cover. Screw it in and tighten it with a wrench. The tube should be safety to the gear case cover. Put a new gasket for the oil sump on the mounting studs. Then fit the oil sump on the six mounting studs, being careful not to damage the tube as you do, you do so. Reinstall the nuts and safety them. Reinstall the oil plug with a new gasket in the bottom of the sump and then safety it. Now you can remove the connections that you use to hold the tappets in place and rotate the engine to a position convenient for installing the hydraulic plungers. Dip the plungers in oil and pump them several times to remove the air and fill them with oil. Insert the units, tube end first, in the cam follower body. Then insert the tappet cups. The units have all been, all been installed. Put a new gasket over the studs and replace the push rod housing flange over the studs and gasket. Install the nuts and safety them with pal nuts. Now install the propeller hub key. 
tapping it into place carefully with a soft-faced mallet. You're ready now to install the pistons and cylinders. When they're all in place, reinstall all the spark plugs and reconnect the ignition wires. Check the timing of the valves, referring to your engine manual for opening and closing points. And finally, with the engine reinstalled on the airplane, Mount the two magnetos and time them to the engine. This will put the plane in readiness for a ground run-up, after which there should be a final check before the flight test.